Today, we have a very special session, and I'm honored to introduce Michael Bungay Stanier, also known as MBS. Correct, Michael? <laughs> Yep. Yeah. But not the not the not the nasty MBS in Saudi Arabia. I'm I'm not running Saudi Arabia as my kind of part time gig. I'm just MBS <laughs> because it's just easier to say than Michael Bungay Stanya. <laughs> I so appreciate that. Thank you, Michael. In 2019, Michael Bungay Stanya was named the number one thought leader in coaching. He is the best selling author of The Coaching Habit, and has a gift for helping people understand core ideas in a practical, accessible, and simple way. Michael is a regular and firm favorite at WBEX summits. As a speaker, he has been featured in Psychology Today and on TED.com, as well as having collaborated with respected experts, including Seth Godin and Brene Brown. And here's your fun fact for today. Michael just shared with me, Michael, you once ran a 10 kilometer race dressed as the sugar plum fairy. Exactly. Same one. And in fact, I'm going to show you a photo of this. So this is actually the high point of this entire session. It's all downhill from here. But there I am as a 20 year old wearing a pink tutu that I made myself and gold headband and stars and quite and the wand, quite the thing. I mean, that's that's 30 years ago. I was into gender fluidity way, way before it became a real thing. So anyway, that's my fun fact. Awesome. Um, well, with that, I'll hand it over to you, Michael. Take perfect. it away. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. Oh, Gary's here. Gary Schleifer, uh, creator of uh, Choice Magazine, a great magazine for coaches. So nice to see you, Gary. Thanks for the nice comment. The true MBS revealed. Exactly. So this is, I think, this is the 11th WBEX. I think this is my 10th year of doing WBEX. So I'm thrilled to be back. It's always lovely to see such a great audience. Thank you for choosing to come to this one because honestly, there's so much good stuff on offer at WBEX. It can be a little overwhelming, quite frankly. Um, so for you to decide to come, you know, not to sign up, but to show up here and be here with me is a treat. Um, we're going to work together for about an hour, and then we've got uh, whatever it takes, about 30 minutes or so, if there are any questions that come from that. As Lucy said, look, I'm probably best known for this, uh, the, a pair of books I wrote called The Coaching Habit, and then a kind of sister book to that, The Advice Trap. Um, and they've gone on to sell <laughs> over a million copies now, so it's pretty exciting. Um, and lovely to think that I'm contributing to the coaching world through some of the tools in that that um, book and often the stuff that I've taught in previous W Beck sessions has been pulling out a tool or pulling out a kind of an insight from one of those books and teaching around it. Today we, we move a bit more into the future because I've got a new book coming out in January called How to Begin, Start Doing Something That Matters and I want to talk about, um, I, I teach a little bit of a process that I talk about in the new book. So it is, and this is uh, the title of this workshop is how to be ambitious. And actually, I want this to be the call for you as coaches to be ambitious for yourself and for the world. And that's what we're going to kind of dig in today to be ambitious for yourself and for the world. Because I want this to be true for you. And I want it to be true for the people with whom you work, your clients. Um, you know, when you come to the why of the work, why do we do this stuff? It's like to make people better and to make the world better. And to do that, you have to have the appropriate level of ambition for ourselves and for the world. And I sometimes think we sell ourselves short on that. And I want to help not have that happen. So here we go. Um, the foundational belief that I've got as part of this, and you'll see this coming through as well, is we unlock our greatness by working on the hard stuff. So part of what we can do with our clients and part of what we can do ourselves is get really clear what our ambition is, what the hard stuff is, find a way to have the courage and the capacity and the capability to work on it and, and know that that's going to unlock the very best of who we are and is going to contribute to the world. So you can see that this is going to be, a, this can be a bit provocative. This will be a bit of a challenging session if you want to make it so. So I've got two questions to ask you to, to start off as a check-in question. Um, Karen, I see you're saying move my mic out of the screen, but I can't do that because otherwise you won't be able to hear me. So we're going to have to work with my mic here. I know it's a big mic, but what can I say? Um, 
question number one, and I want you to put your answers in the, Q, in the chat, please, the Q&A that we're using. On a scale of one to seven, how focused do you plan to be with me over the next hour and a half? How focused do you plan to be? One is honestly not focused at all. I don't even know why I'm here. I've got so much other stuff to do. And you know what? I'll just have Michael rabbiting on in the background. Meantime, I'll just kind of get on with a whole bunch of other stuff. I've got texting to do. I've got emails to do. The kids are burning something in the corner over there. So I'm probably looking at that. There's a band playing over in that corner. I'm going to be pretty distracted. That's a one. Seven, on the other hand, is like, oh, this is the session I've been waiting for. This is what I'm here for. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and you're doing all you can to bring real focus. And I'm asking this question because, honestly, uh, webinars are hard to focus on. There's so much going on. We're often in our own home office. You know, one brief moment of being kind of subpar and you're checking your emails or checking your phone or whatever it is. So I just want you to set your own intention around how focused you'd like to be. I'm seeing sevens and nines and sixes and tens. So clearly, I'm, there's a whole bunch of you who I'm never hiring as an accountant, or those of you who are giving me 10 out of seven. But um, I appreciate you, whatever number you're choosing, that's fine. You know, I don't mind if it's a three or a two or a six, whatever it is. I'm just asking you to make the choice. This is so often what we do as coaches, which is make the choice clear, trust the other person to make that choice. But here's what I want you to do. Have them set your number, whether it's a six, whether it's a seven, whether it's a 10. <laughs> I want you to adjust your environment so that you're better able to hit that number. So what's one thing you need to do? Just one that will give you a better chance of being fully present in the way you want to be present in this workshop with me. I know for me, it's moving my phone out of reach. Actually, I put my phone in another room because honestly, even when I'm the presenter, I want to take a break and check my email. So I've moved my phone out of the way and I've shut down a few other windows as well on my computer. Um, but make the, make the one adjustment you need to make to be fully present with me here in the way that you want to. So that's a good start, setting up our environment. Our environment, do you know that quote from Winston Churchill? We shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. If we want to behave in a certain way, shape your environment to give you the cues to behave in that way. And that's what we're doing at a micro scale here. I've got a second check-in question for you. Same principle, one to seven. But this is about you deciding what you're up for. And it's also about creating a degree of psychological safety here as well. And the question I've got for you is this, how deep would you like to go today? How deep? And there's no wrong answer here. There's no kind of, you know, you get a medal for saying seven. It's like you guests get to choose what feels right for you at the moment. If it's like a two and you want to skip along the surface and just listen and not even do the work that I'm going to suggest we do, because this will be interactive, that's fine. If you're like, you're like, oh no, <laughs> reach in and, and pull me forward, Michael, that's, that's great as well. The choice is entirely yours. But I'm like, how, how are you doing? How resourced do you feel at the moment? How courageous do you feel at the moment? How willing are you to kind of look at yourself in the mirror at the moment? And in a, in a guilt-free way, pick the number that seems most right for you. You've got full permission to choose whatever you want. And I'm going to just talk to Lucy a little bit as we go through this hour together, because um, she's in some ways the voice of the, of the audience. There's you know, 700 of you here, so I can't talk to all of you. Lucy, let me check in with you. What, what were your numbers, if I can ask? Absolutely. Well, as a host, I'm a seven for the first one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like supercharged. Kind of alert. Relief, I think, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how and deep do you want to go? How deep? Well, you see, when I heard that question, my eyes lit up because mm. deep is my thing. Nice. Um, so I'm thinking that's a, a, what, a six, a seven? A it's nine. a, you got, I would say, you know, out of seven. I like I, I'm going <laughs> to, thanks for asking. I'm actually going to go for a fraction and say it's going to be a 6.7. 6.7, I like it. Brilliant, yeah. Lucy, thank you. And um, here's a thing that might be interesting for you as a coach. You can take these questions and mm -hmm. use them as a kind of check-in with your coaching clients if you're in conversation with them. Mm -hmm. Because so often when we start a coaching call or a coaching conversation, we kind of just get into it right away. And I think actually a little check-in questions, and you've got two here. You don't have to use them. You could use your own versions. 
you know, sometimes I ask, how much risk are you willing to take? Um, sometimes um, I'll ask another, another question, but imagine this, at the start of every coaching conversation, you go, hey, let me check in. Today, how focused are you ready to be? And today, how deep do you want to go? And that primes them to make a choice. And it sets up what I would call a social contract, almost an operating manual between the two of you around what this call might be like. I do think that one of the things that makes for a successful um, conversation is um, to talk about how we're going to have the conversation before you get into the details of the conversation. And I think often in our coaching chats, we miss that because we, we, we're too excited to get into the content. All right. Let's talk about how to be ambitious. At the heart of this idea, the heart of this new book is what does it mean to set a worthy goal? What does it mean to set a worthy goal? That's loaded language. I mean, we've all done goal setting. I'm sure you've covered that in some part of your coach training around what does it mean to set a goal? A lot of us have heard of smart goals before, specific, measurable, something, something, and something. I can't even remember what that, that, that acronym is about. But I always think with a SMART goal, it, it tends to be kind of contained and neat and packaged. And it's more about, almost more about bureaucracy than it is about ambition. And a worthy goal, I love that language. I'm biased, of course, because it says, I need a goal that is worthy of my life. And I need a goal that is worthy of the world. So I think this is the first part that we're going to look at today is pick a worthy goal. And you might be going, great, Michael, nice language. What does that even mean? <laughs> like, I'm glad you asked. I think a worthy goal has three key attributes to it, three legs on the stool. You need all three. And I'm going to go through each one of these uh, one by one. Well, that's interesting. Thrilling and important and daunting. Thrilling, important, and daunting. So let's talk about... What those three uh, what those three characteristics are thrilling is the goal the thing that lights you up that speaks to your values that speaks to who you want to be in the world thrilling is when you hear that and you think to yourself oh man yeah I would love to do that you can feel the blood quickening you can feel your heart beating a little bit more it's got that to it and honestly, that's where a lot of us start with our goals already. So that's not so much of a surprise to, to many of you, which is like you want a goal that is actually exciting to you. Here's why it's really important to have thrilling as part of the mix rather than just assumed, which is it challenges and it counteracts any sense of obligation. Because all of us, to a greater or lesser extent, sometimes feel that we've got to take on a goal because it's the thing we should be doing. Sometimes that pressure comes from outside us. There are other people saying, this is what you should be striving for. Sometimes we've internalized it and we've gone, you know, for a person of my age and my experience and my place in my life at the moment, this is probably what I should be striving for. There's a kind of societal pressure that we've, we've absorbed. And what this actually says is put obligation aside and see what you can hear, that silent, quiet voice of yourself saying, this is the goal that would light me up. So it's thrilling, important because it speaks to your values, which I know as coaches you're, you're, you're conversing with and, and uh, capable of working with your clients on and yourself on. And it's also a counteract to the sense of obligation. The second component Thrilling is number one. The second is important. And this is probably the one I get most excited about. Uh, you know what? I like all of them. I'm, I, what am I saying? I'm lying. I like all of these. <laughs> but important is, um, well, look, I, I read a book about a year ago by a woman called Jacqueline Novogratz. N-O-V-O-G-R-A-T-Z or T-Z, depending on where you live in the world. And the book is called A Manifesto for a Moral Revolution. She has a, a TED talk on this, uh, if you want to look it up. And Jacqueline Novogratz is a really interesting woman. She has started a company, an organization called Acumen. And Acumen is a basically a venture capitalist firm 
for non-profit and socially driven enterprises. So she's looking for enterprises around the world that are doing good and she's finding ways to fund them to help them be successful businesses. And the phrase that I read in her book and then heard again in her TED talk is this, what if we could give more to the world than we take? What if we could give more to the world than we take? And, and that's it. <laughs> you know, I think we are in a place where wherever you are in the world, whether you're young and the start of your life, getting towards the end of it like I am, somewhere in the middle, whether you're wealthier or less wealthy, there's a place you can say, what's my contribu contribution to the bigger game? My contribution to the, to the bigger world? How do I play for that? Because there's a way that that actually, there's all sorts of research that says that sense of bigger contribution is one of the key sources of happiness and contentment, as well, of course, of making the world a better place. So why I think important as part of it is because it creates that sense of service. And also it's a counteract against selfishness. Because one of the things that I am sometimes a bit underwhelmed by in the world of self-development is it can all get a little bit me, me, me around what this is about and what I want and what's my good life and how will I be happy and how will I measure success. And there's a way that we need to nurture ourselves, absolutely. But thrilling and important actually stand in a bit of tension with each other. And that's the way it should be which is like thrilling is self-serving, important is world-serving, and how do you find a worthy goal that meets those two in the middle? Um, so Sue Baggett's asking for Jacqueline's name and book and TED Talk in the chat. I'll spell her name one more time for you in case it doesn't make it into the chat. So Jacqueline Novogratz, N-O-V-O-G-R-A-T-Z. And the book is called A Manifesto for a moral revolution. Then, there, then we have um, the third element, thrilling, important, and daunting. <laughs> and daunting, of course, is a bit of a daunting word because you're like, oh, that sounds a bit scary. And you know what? It is a little bit scary because what daunting means is this is a worthy goal that takes you to the edge of yourself, to the edge of your confidence and your competence and your sense of who you are in this world. It is a goal that is going to teach you stuff. It is a goal that is going to create new neural pathways in your brain wave. I was speaking to um, a wonderful uh, a writer and speaker who I think has uh, been part of W. Beck's in the past. Her name is Liz Wiseman. She is famous for a book called Multipliers, which if you work in organizations at all, you should know about because it's about the people who, who help their people thrive. But as coaches, you should know about this because it's a great model around what is it to be a multiplier and what is it to be a diminisher. Um, and she has a new book coming out called uh, Impact Players. Who are the people who make an outsized impact in the work that they do? And she and I were talking about this and she said a great tool for um, what daunting is, is I know how to start it, but I don't know how to finish it. I thought that was just about right in terms of um, understanding what feels daunting. You're like, I, you know, it's not so daunting that I don't know how to do the first thing, but I have no idea how this story ends. That feels about right for daunting. So let me check in with you because that's the, that's the foundational insight, which is a worthy goal has three aspects to it, thrilling and important and daunting. And what I'd love to see in the chat, in the Q&A is, what feels most useful or most valuable for you about that so far? What struck a chord? You know, we're 22 minutes into this session. What's been most useful or most valuable for you so far? For those of you who, who know my books and my works, you'll know that this is the learning question. Um, and for those of you who know about designing teaching, you know that you want to be asking this on a regular basis because A, it helps you as the listener kind of start extracting the value. So you're not just taking notes, but you're asking yourself that meta question, what's useful here? What do I want to remember? What's valuable? But also I'm asking you this because I want to clear the cache. I want to, I want to give you a chance to process the content you've got already 
and have you ready for the next piece of content that I want to share with you. So lots of interesting things coming through, tension between self-serving and work-serving, um, unlock our greatness by working on the hard stuff from Mark, thank you. Give more than we can take from Rick, that quote from Jacqueline Novogratz, brilliant. Taking the edge of myself at the intersection of serving myself and serving the world from Carolyn, that's beautiful. Lucy, what are you seeing here? Just checking in with you, anything here you're seeing that really strikes a chord? Yeah, I think the tension piece <laughs> that struck a chord for me, the creative tension yeah. that happens when we take these opposing pieces and then look for the middle, the third. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, so lots of nice comments coming through this. And look, part of what I love about WBEX is um, both in these sessions themselves and then in the sessions afterwards is there's this real sense of a community and us learning from each other. I know we tend to feature me or other people as the speakers giving you the content. But the chat is so valuable because it is this the wisdom is in the room and as valuable if not more valuable than what i'm teaching you is what you're seeing from your colleagues in the chat here so make sure that you're kind of making the most of that and seeing what's in the chat um and i'm also seeing just a quick note from joanne burgos there saying she loves how i teach that i, I love i'm um, thank you and also one of the things that you can watch me do is how am I teaching you over this webinar? How am I doing things differently? How am I being a bit provocative? How am I being more personal? How am I using bits of paper differently? Um, because if you are a teacher, and many of you are, and a facilitator, you're welcome to take what I do as a teacher and a facilitator and take that and adapt that and use that in your own style as well. So make sure that you're kind of watching me at a meta level if that's of interest to you, as well as the kind of content as well. Let's talk about um, where you find a worthy goal. Now, here's what I know to be true. As I define thrilling, important, and daunting, there are some of you who go, yep, <laughs> I know what my worthy goal is. You've already got it. You might even be working on it in, in some way, or it might be just that thing that's floating around in your head and me talking about a worthy goal and me talking about thrilling, important, and daunting has catalyzed it a little bit in your head. And that's great. And then there are others of you going, well, look, this sounds great. And I'd like this for me and for the people that I coach and I work with. But where do I, where do I find a worthy goal? Where do I even start looking? Because I'm, I'm, nothing comes to mind immediately or it's pretty vague. How do I start looking for that? Well, let me give you the three different lenses that I think you can use to kind of uncover a worthy goal. And you might not need all of them, but you might need some of them. So this, again, these are tools that you can take and, and work with your clients on as well as doing the work yourself right now around this. I, I just start off by dividing the world in half and I go work and not work. I don't love that division. I just can't come up with a better one. I don't love it because it makes work sound like it's the important thing and not work make it sound like it's the kind of miscellaneous leftovers. And I just don't think that's really how life uh, is for many of us. But it's, it's a helpful start. Just go, look, work and not work. And I think one of the ways it can be helpful is this. If you're the sort of person who goes, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm work forward. <laughs> I put work at the front. So you're assuming that your worthy goal has to come from your work world. What I will offer instead is to say, you should also look in the not work part of your world because that might be an undeveloped part of your life that you may go, it will strengthen and become enriched by finding a worthy goal in not work. And, you know, flip it around as well. If you're a person who's like, you know, work, I just do to pay the bills, but really I find enrichment in the, the not work part of my life. And that's great. What you might want to do is go, what if there was a worthy goal within the work context? Would that actually change my relationship to work and the way it's being done? Um, I'm just keeping my eye on what's coming through in the chat. Um, Adam Smith, who has written a, a wonderful historical novel 200 years ago, book 200 years ago, will there be slides available, including the information presented? No, there weren't. This is it. I, I don't use slides. I don't do handouts. So make sure that you're taking notes as we go through this. Um, or else you're just going to have to wait for the book to come out where it, it, it is covered. So, um, and Bridget's asking, can a worthy goal be for both? Yeah, I think it can. I think there's 
probably, you know, as soon as you make a model, it's wrong, but it might be useful. So it could be a, a, a goal that, that uh, covers both of those worlds, perhaps. I can see how that's a possibility. So work, non-work, that's a nice, easy division. The second um, lens is to be thinking about scale. And I think you can scale from narrow to broad or kind of from intimate, I think, is how I might use this to, to broad. There is a way that we default to wanting to make our worthy goals kind of like Gandhi-esque. You know, it's like, I need to liberate a continent or something for it to be truly a worthy goal. And I don't think that needs to be true at all. I think a worthy goal, thrilling, important and daunting can be, can operate in actually quite a, a, a tight, narrow, intimate focus. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Here's the context, the work and non-work, and here's a sense of scale. So what you have here is the non-work. And I think probably the most intimate place to start is probably family. It's like, okay, you know, how do I be a better spouse, a better parent, a better child, a better, a, a better relation in some way? There's absolutely a way that a worthy goal could be very focused on the dynamic of a family. Or maybe you're stretching it to a community. Maybe your community is local, like my community is Bronces Bales in Toronto. Um, maybe it's Toronto, maybe it's Ontario. You know, you can define the boundaries of your community, but there may be a focus there where you're like, actually it's at that level that it feels my worthy goal might be best placed. If you're a content creator, like many of us are, you might be thinking about your audience. You know, what's my audience? Who do I serve? Because, you know, my audience is global. You know, just like W. Betts's audience is global. There are people from everywhere on this call with me today, which is amazing. But you might be going, how do I make a worthy goal that is in service to my audience? And then perhaps you're, maybe you're the new Greta Thunberg. And you're like, actually, there's a movement that transcends the boundaries and it transcends my audience. I mean, a movement by its nature has to go beyond your audience, your own people, and it has to touch other people. So maybe there's something there. And then in work, you can see a similar scale going from intimate to broad. You know, your team, your business unit, your organization, maybe you're thinking about strategy or culture at that kind of organizational level. Um, because you know, even if you're just running your own solopreneur business or you've got one or two people who help out, you need to think about strategy, you think, need to think about culture, or maybe you're thinking about how your business interacts with society, how it is a good citizen as an organization, as a, as a work thing. So you can see that there, there are different places to look. And my guess is as soon as you start scanning that, you're gonna start finding some possibilities around, Maybe there's something here or there or somewhere else that might be thrilling or important or daunting for me to take on. So the final, <laughs> I'm laughing, I'm seeing Gary, I know where Roncesvalles is, does that count? I'm like, absolutely, Gary. And then I know where you live as well, I think, so we're close to each other. I've got a, a final lens that I want to share with you, and it's the 3P lens. Um, I think I first talked about this in the coaching habit, but it seems to keep coming up as a useful way of seeing the world. Um, and it, it's almost a different weight or emphasis that you put about what matters in, in the worthy goal that you set yourself. And I think you can be focused on projects or people or patterns. Now, in any worthy goal, all three of these play a role. You can't have a worthy goal that doesn't have all three of these surfacing. You're just choosing which one feels most important, which one you're going to kind of put into the spotlight a little bit more. So projects is the most obvious one. And that's where most of us start, which is what's, what's the thing that needs to be done? I need to build it. I need to start it. I need to create it. I need to launch it. I need to deconstruct it. I need to change it. It's kind of like getting dirt, digital or otherwise, under your fingernails in terms of the building of it. The people, the second P, puts the weight on the relationship. You know, how do I improve this interaction and this relationship with this person or with this group of people? And you're kind of thinking that that might be the, the key place to look at and the key place to emphasize. And then the third place is patterns, which is 
in some ways the deepest because it's the most self-reflective. It's like, what are your patterns of behavior that need to be looked at and presumably need to be changed? How do you want to change yourself in this? So this is the, 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 the doing of it. This is the, the relationship of it. And this is how you show up and contribute to it. Projects, people, and patterns. So you've got the, the, the principles of a worthy goal, thrilling and important and daunting. And you've got different places that you might be looking for it. Work, not work, the different scale from intimate to broad, and then the three Ps, the people, the pattern, uh, projects, people, and patterns. Here's what I want you to do. Wherever you're taking notes, I want you to write your first draft of a worthy goal for you. Now, look, I'm a writer. I've written seven or eight books. Here's what I can reassure you. Your first draft is always crap. <laughs> so what I'm asking for is a crappy first draft. I mean, mediocre. Really, the standard is just some words on the page. It does not have to be good. It does not have to be right. It just has to be you having the courage to write something down. Some of you, of course, are uh, you're, you're like, I think I know what this is, and it's going to be fast and easy. Some of you are finding the resistance <laughs> to this, going, oh, no, I don't want to write it down. Don't make me. I don't even know what it is. I'll probably get it wrong. I'm like, I hear you, and I don't care. Write down that crappy first draft for me. And we're going to go through a couple of more drafts. That's what we're going to cover in this session. A couple more drafts. So we're going to improve this. I'm not going to leave you here. But I want you to write down that first draft. And if you're willing, this is your choice entirely. If you're willing, consider sharing it in the uh, in the Q and A in the in the where we're putting in the chat at the moment. Because honestly, it's kind of cool to watch um, and see other people's first drafts of their worthy goal. So if you're willing to share, that's great. If you're not willing to share, that's perfectly okay as well. But everybody's cheering you on. Everybody has your back here. Everybody's saluting your courage and your confidence in terms of willing to share. And I'm seeing a whole bunch of wonderful things coming through. Overcoming your bouts with imposter syndrome, brilliant. Help people in the world live with no regrets, fantastic. Um, develop team coaching curricula for new leaders, brilliant. Um, make escaping poverty unstoppable, starting with 125 families in Gary, Indiana. Stephen, that sounds a, a wonderful goal. Bring happiness to the world. So you can see it's interesting com what's coming through is some people are really kind of huge and broad in, in the size of the goal, like Juanita, bring happiness to the world. Really powerful sentiment, very broad goal. Some people are really specific, you know, 125 families in Gary, Indiana. Um, and we're going to talk about that in just, a, in just a second. But before I do that, I'm just going to call Lucy up on the camera. And I'm going to check in with Lucy. Lucy, are you willing to share your first draft with us? I know it's putting you on the spot in a terrible way. And you have full permission to say, Michael, I'd just rather not. But thank you for the invitation anyway. Oh, my gosh. Um, yeah, thanks for putting me on the spot. I totally am. <laughs> You did forewarn me, though, so it's on me. Um, I've been taking a look, actually, at people's goals and, like mm. you, noticing those patterns. Um, and and so I think what's coming up for me was really, it's really around, uh, huh, it's really around my family is what's coming up. Mm. <laughs> so making right. an impact um, in terms of being a parent to two adult boys in, in yeah. a changing and scary world love it that's wonderful that's a wonderful first draft it's specific mm -hmm. i understand it's not work it's got a degree of real intimacy to it and i understand just intuitively how that serves you and also how it serves the well and i can also i'm, I'm child free myself and delighted to be child free but i can guess how daunting it is to try and be and re-evaluate your parenting relationship with your with your two sons as well so yeah wonderful thanks for sharing that um cool lots of thank you look at this look how awesome you guys all are sharing these goals i salute you um i'm in awe of you honestly it's fantastic um tell me what's been useful or valuable so far you know why i'm asking you this i'm going to keep i'm going to do it 
another two times at least before we're done here. But in terms of the lenses to find the worthy goal and then you having the courage to name and write down a first draft, what's felt useful or valuable about that process for you? Let me see. Gosh, there's the narrative broad lens. It's a solid start. It's wonderful. Thoughts into action. Gary going, I already have one, which is fantastic. So useful to having to actually do it. Yeah, so, so often what we do as a coach is we just try and make manifest what's already there. I don't know about you, but whenever I have a, whenever I, I don't really coach people now, but when I did, um, almost inevitably the first conversation, the person would go, oh, Michael, you know what? I really want to do this, this, and this. And I would say, this is my brilliant coaching intervention. Well, you should do that then. And they're like, oh, you're amazing. <laughs> like, that's yeah, true. I am amazing. But so often it's, it's just going, let me just name it and, and write it and commit to it is itself a powerful intervention. And Lucy, what's up? Yeah. I just thought I'd read this one out. Uh, a few yeah. people have said this, but I'm seeing with Roland. Actually, I'm still struggling. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I'm trying to do something that, actually, let me, let me speak to that. So I, I appreciate the people going, I'm still struggling about that. And one way you react to that is like, oh man, look at all these other people writing down goals and I'm not writing down a goal, what's wrong with me? And I want you to let that go, <sighs> just let it go. It is, it is a thing to actually come up with a worthy goal. It's hard and you're either closer to it or further away from it. It doesn't really matter. Um, we are, we're cracking on at a pace around this. Like we're, you don't know me, we have a degree of trust, but it's only a degree of trust. And um, you're not just necessarily quite right in the right place right now to be thinking through a worthy goal. It is fine. Um, sometimes it's actually helpful to kind of go at a pace through um, a process like this because you don't almost don't have time to think too hard about it you're just being forced to get stuff down but sometimes it doesn't serve you at all so just to acknowledge that for some people this is too fast and too much and a bit too overwhelming if that's you take your best guess anyway even if you're like this isn't my worthy goal but I'm going to write it down anyway that's fine and know that I'm teaching you a process and the process is what matters most here rather than necessarily the content that you're actually creating at the moment. It's that kind of the, all the content is bonus to you. So I hope that kind of reassures you that where, wherever you're at, you're doing, you're doing great. You're awesome. You're doing great. Now, first draft, always a bit crap. That's great. Um, we want to know how to write a good second draft. And that's where we're going to right now. And we're going to test the 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 worthy gold draft that you've given yourself right now to see how it stands up so we're going to apply three tests against the thrilling element we're going to apply the spouse ish test against the important element we're going to apply the foso test and against the daunting um, element we're going to apply the goldilocks zone test spouse ish foso and goldilocks so we'll go through these one by one. Um, the spouse-ish test. Now, if you're lucky, you have somebody in your life who knows you well, who has heard your stories more than once, who's heard your jokes more than once, and actually still laughs at one or two of those jokes, who has seen you at your best, has seen you messy, um, who kind of knows your patterns and your, your, the way that you show up in the world, kind of a BFF of some sort. If you're lucky, well, no, if you, one version of that is they're your spouse. And I happen to have a spouse who plays that role for me. I've been married for, uh, actually, we just, um, just the other day, five days ago, celebrated our, the 30th anniversary from our first date. Her name's Marcella, and she plays all of those roles for me. But, you know, for some of us, we don't have a spouse, or for some of us, our spouse isn't quite that person. All of that's great. If you're lucky, you have somebody in your life who had that person where you're like, yeah, they get me. 
So here's what I want you to imagine. And this is the, the spouse-ish test. I want you to imagine telling your spouse the worthy goal that you've set yourself. I mean, you can actually go and do this. Um, you know, it can be a thought experiment or it can be a, um, an actual thing you go and do. But if you told your spouse this idea or your spouse-ish person, you know, how would they react? And I think that there are three different ways that they might react. One is they go, amazing. <laughs> that is a wonderful idea. I mean, it is just a perfect expression of who you are and who you want to be in the world. And I love it and it's fantastic and you're amazing and this is amazing and great. That's a piece of data. It's not necessarily the truth, but it's a piece of data. Here's the second reaction that you might get from them. No, 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 no. No, absolutely. That is a, what, what is wrong with you? <laughs> that is a terrible idea. You should definitely not do that. Also, not the truth, just a piece of data. The third reaction that I've seen and experienced, because I've had all of these reactions from Marcel and my spouse-ish person, is it's kind of yes with an asterisk. It goes like this. Yes, but could you stop talking about it and get on with it, please? Because you keep going on and on and on and on about this thing and you don't actually act on it. So get going on it, please, and stop bothering me with it because I'm a bit tired of hearing about this worthy goal that you talk up but never act on. So I think you've got uh, a reaction from a spouse. Now, you need to know that, again, and I'll say it really clearly, it's not the truth. It's not the answer. It's a piece of data from somebody who knows you well. And here's a, here's a story that <laughs> Masala doesn't like me telling, but I'm going to tell you anyway. When I, five years ago or six years ago, came to her and I went, I've got this idea for a book. It's called The Coaching Habit. And I think I'm going to write it now. She went, no, <laughs> do not write that book. You, you are so behind in things you should be doing. You owe me alone 60 different emails on assorted topics and answers to questions that I have. You know, get your life in order and sort that out first. And then maybe we can talk about the book. And I went, that's really interesting. I'm definitely going to write the book now. So even her no helped me figure out how resonant this worthy goal was for me. So that's the, I'm just looking at Leanne's note and it's a good one. I'm worried about the spouse friend reaction overshadowing the voice of the person who's come up with the goal, especially for women and people pleasers. So brilliant comment, Le Leanne, I agree with you. That's why I'm saying that this is a piece of data rather than the actual answer. So you're not asking permission, you're just asking for their response to it and how they will respond will give you data about how you feel about your worthy goal. The second test is, and I think that kind of speaks to the thrilling side of it. The second test is the FOSO test. And FOSO isn't a kind of wrong version of FOMO and it's not a funky district in downtown New York. FOSO stands for, for the sake of. So as you look at your worthy goal, as you've drafted it at the moment, and you ask yourself, well, for the sake of what would I be doing this? And I'm curious to know what your answer to that might be, because what it's pointing you to is how does this give more to the world than it takes? It helps if you like Simon Sinek's work. It helps you find and articulate the why of the work or get you a little bit closer to the why of the work. So what's the FOSO there? And Lucy, you've jumped on. So that often means you have a comment that you want to point out to me. What's, the, what's your thought? Earlier, uh, a little earlier, somebody posted a question around um, the thrilling, important, important and daunting. How is it similar or different from uh, your why, your personal why or your purpose? Yeah, I think- Yeah, um, Susan, Susan posed that yeah. question. It's a great question. So I'll, I'll stop and I'll answer that bigger picture. So the way I think of it is as, um, I'm not sure what the metaphor is. I go, look, I've got a bigger purpose, a bigger why in my, my life. The, the language I use around it for me is I want to infect a billion people with the possibility virus. Now, 
that sounded much better 20 years ago when I came up with it before there was a global pandemic, but that's my metaphor and I'm sticking with it. Infect a billion people with the possibility virus, giving people the courage to make, to see the choices and make bolder choices. And it fuels a lot of the work that I do because I go, what's the best way, what's the best project I can come up with that might serve that? I think a worthy goal becomes your, the catalyzation of your best guess around how you might achieve the bigger purpose. So I saw somebody like Kelly Hendrickson is asking, can you have more than one worthy goal? You probably can, but it's quite hard to do two worthy goals at once. Part of the, the courage here is to have the courage of committing to one and giving it a go and seeing how it works. So I go bigger purpose, worthy goal, and then Ainsley and I, who works with me at mbs.works, we, we run chapters. And a chapter is a six-week sprint working on our worthy goal. And at the end of six weeks, we stop and we take a break and we go, how's this going? Is this still the worthy goal? Is this still the right work? What do I do now? So we then figure out how to do the work to support it in kind of smaller, smaller chunks as well. All right. Where was I? So FOSO, so that's the second of the test. So uh, testing the thrilling is a spouse's test. Testing important is the FOSO test. And then testing the daunting, and this is gonna be important, is uh, the Goldilocks zone. So you guys have all heard of Goldilocks, or most of you will have heard of Goldilocks. So bears and beds and porridge, and you know, too big, too small, just right. And what I love is that in astronomy, um, they've taken that same idea and in the, in the search for exoplanets, so these are other planets other than ours around different stars other than ours, that discipline and science has exploded. So they've now found thousands of other planets out there in the universe, which is amazing. But they're particularly interested in planets that are in the Goldilocks zone. Because the Goldilocks zone is not too close to the sun and not too far from the sun so that water is liquid. Because if water is liquid, and water is one of the building blocks of life, then something interesting might be happening on that particular planet. So obviously, Earth is in the Goldilocks zone relative to our star. And that's the quest for astronomers. So part of the, the daunting piece is to find the right heft, the right weight, the right kind of size of your worthy goal. You don't want it to be so small that it is trivial. You don't want it to be so large that it's impossible and overwhelming. And my guess is that as I saw some of the drafts of the first worthy goals coming through, the, some of the first drafts, some of them felt just a little big, like bringing happiness to the world is a brilliant motivation. But honestly, as a worthy goal, it's hard to get your hands around that. Whereas, for instance, the, the worthy goal I saw around targeting 150 families in this part of the world, that felt like it probably had about the right heft. So here's what I'm going to ask us to do. I'm going to ask you to do a second draft of, of your worthy goal. And you're you're building two things into the second draft. You're building in whatever data you've gathered from just running through the, those tests in your head because they're thought experiments at the moment. And the second thing I'm going to ask you to do is you're going to ask, you're going to verb your worthy goal. <laughs> what do I mean by verbing it? I mean, I want you to start it with a doing word, an action word. Because here's one of the truths about worthy goals that I've figured out, that it's incredibly powerful to name it and name the outcome that you want. But the, the gold is in the process. The gold is in the doing of it. Because actually, once you start the journey, what your worthy goal is sometimes shifts and sometimes changes and sometimes evolves in the work that you're doing. So I want you to start your worthy goal, not with an outcome, but with a, a verb. And I've got some verbs for you there. It's just a start. I mean, there's a thousand, thousand verbs. Build, create, break, disrupt, start, change, stop, launch, ask for, reinvent, begin, challenge. 
So you're welcome to steal or borrow any of those verbs. And if you'd like um, other verbs, pick the one that kind of works best for you. So make it a make it an action. Start your word with that. Tweak your worthy goal in any way that you see fit based on the, the FOSO test and the Goldilocks zone test and the spouse-ish test. And it's just, it's a draft. It doesn't have to be perfect. You're just, sometimes, honestly, sometimes second drafts are worse than your first draft. That's fine. It's the, it's the work that matters here, not, the, not what actually ends up on the paper. It's the fact that you're sitting here in this place of discomfort and ambiguity and uncertainty going, I should never have said seven out of seven in terms of how deep am I willing to go when Michael asked me that question to check in. That's where the magic's happening. So even if this is if this is easy and if it's hard, if you're really clear or if you're not clear, something's happening. Something's working on you at the moment, and it's powerful. Lucy. Mm -hmm. Well, we've seen many people actually post in asking for you to elaborate on um, FOSO. If you could, right. for the sake of, can you say more while they're writing their sure. second draft? A natural bias, because we're humans, is that when we write the um, create our worthy goal it's the daunting you get because it's you know you're you're doing it's, it's a stretch and the thrilling you get because you're naming something that matters to you and is important to you but one of the things that can often get in our way and leave us to abandon our worthy goals is it's not playing to a bigger game you know the kind of most or one of the pernicious versions examples of this is women negotiating their salaries. So we all know that there's a, a wage gap between men and women. And if you look at the data, women tend to under ask for what they're worth when they're negotiating for salaries, when men ask what they think they're worth, which, you know, quite frankly, they're often <laughs> overvaluing their contribution. But there's a real gap there because women are like, you know, I have to I have to tick all the boxes and then some additional boxes for me to ask for what I think I'm worth. And men are like, hey, look, I'm just going to ask because what have I got to lose? You know, I'm simplifying the research here, obviously. And um, one of the, the interesting things that happens is if you say to a woman, you're not negotiating for yourself, you're negotiating for your family you suddenly find that they negotiate in exactly the same way as a man does. They ask for the same amount of money. They present the same amount of, of confidence around that. So there's something about being clear on the bigger game that you're playing for allows you to be more courageous and keep going and not abandon it as a indulgence for you, but to say, I'm, I'm, this is, this is going to help the world. So. The FOSO, which is connected to the important piece, which is gives more to the world than it takes, helps you just get clear as to the bigger goal that you're seeking to serve. Yeah, so I'm seeing Julia um, as, as part of a comment going, can you recommend changing the spouse test to the BFF test? You know, I, uh, you, you can certainly recommend that, but I'm not going to change it, but I am keeping it as spouse-ish. So um, BFF, I get why you might say that, but I'm deliberately have chosen spouse-ish. So it's that type of person because I don't want it to be limited to people who just have a particular type of spouse. So I certainly understand the point that you're making there. Right, I'm gonna go for about another um, 10 minutes, maybe five minutes, and then we're gonna open it up to more broad questions. Um, because I've got one more test that I want to take you through before we think about um, perhaps writing a final draft of um, your worthy goal. So here's what I want you to do. Wherever you are with your second draft at the moment, first of all, you're amazing and you're doing great. I salute you for having a second goal down. And we're going to do what I call the voting test. Here's the voting test. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. As you look at what you've written down at the moment, I want you to give your each, I want you to give your worthy goal a score out of seven against each of the three attributes, thrilling and important and daunting. 
So in other words, on a scale of one to seven, how thrilling does this feel to you at the moment? How important does it feel to you on another scale of one to seven? And finally, how daunting does it feel to you on a scale of one to seven? So what that means is you're going to end up with a, a total somewhere between three and 21. Now, this isn't a test. You're not, you don't need to hack the system. This is you just being as honest as you want to be with yourself. You go, how do I feel about this? How would I rate this on one to seven, one to seven, one to seven, and give yourself a score out of, out of 21? Now, if you want to put your, I, I'm seeing some people put their scores down um, in the thing, and he's going eight, 10, and 10. So there's always people resisting my one to seven scale. It's like, no, I need it to be out of 10. But um, so we're getting numbers, 21s, 19s, well, seven, five, and six. What is that? 18, that's great. 16, 15, 13. Well, it's just data. So one of the, I'm a big fan of not beating yourself up when you look at other people's answers. So you're like, if you're like, oh man, I should have 21. I'm like, no, it's just telling you where you're at at the moment. This is just, gathering a piece of data. It's like a radar. You're just pinging the world and having it ping back to you say, this is where you stand at the moment. So thank you for sharing your scores with this. This is wonderful to see. I'll tell you my hypothesis. My hypothesis is, and I'm just making it up, so this may not be true, but my hypothesis that is if it's less than 18, there may still be work to be done on this. Because if it's less than 18, it may not have quite the right mix of thrilling and important and daunting to pull you through. So it might be worth thinking around, well, where do I need to tinker with this? Where do I need to perhaps improve my draft of a worthy goal? And quite frankly, even if you've scored a 21, my guess is that we can tinker with this worthy goal and perhaps even tighten the screws just a little further to make it even more powerful. And the reason we're spending time on this, you know, it comes down to, you know, if you read the coaching habit book, you'll know one of my favorite questions is, so what's the real challenge here for you? Because I think we spend way too much time trying to solve the wrong problems and we don't spend enough time actually figuring out what's at the heart of the issue. And I think that the same happens with goal setting, which is that we spend, we, we too casually come up with a goal and go, okay, that sounds about right, let's plunge on. And what we're doing here is we're really interrogating the goal we're setting to go, can I get it as close to being as powerful and as resonant as possible so that it, that it gains, so that, so that it's worthy of you and your life. So I'm gonna ask you to do a third and final draft. Now it's final, meaning that's the last thing we're doing today. It's a draft, meaning it's not necessarily the finished thing yet. So you still have permission for this not to be perfect. In fact, I demand it. It may not be perfect. That's, a, that's an order. <laughs> but here's what I want you to do. First of all, you got the data from the, the voting test. And you're like, okay, I need to maybe put a little bit more weight on the thrilling or the important or the daunting piece of it. And you know, as an aside, it may, not, it may be that you can't even fix it through the drafting. You may want to go back and go, I need to look somewhere else for a slightly different worthy goal. But here's the, the other twist on this draft. I want you to add one word or one phrase. Now, I don't have a magic word or phrase for everybody, so it's going to depend on you. But I think often a single word or a single phrase can tighten it, bring it even more tightly into focus and make a difference. And I think there are four different places you can look to for a word. I think you can create a new word around the standard at which you're delivering it. Um, I'll give you examples of these in just a minute. I think you can create a word in terms of the reach, being more specific about the reach you want to have. I think you can be more specific about the time in which you will get this done by or get completed by. And I think you can talk about the volume as well, the time it'll take or the, the a quantity that you're striving for. So let me give you some examples of what I mean by that. So a standard, you know, it could be elite, could be good enough. Um, you know, I have a goal at the moment with, a, with my podcast called Two Pages with MBS. 
to be a top 3% podcast, which has a very specific number of kind of downloads and stuff associated with it. So I set a standard that really tightened up my, my worthy goal, which is to make it a top 3% podcast. Your, your reach, um, I've got business unit there. A reach can be both geographic in terms of, I want to, I want to move the entirety of Toronto or I want to move my city or I want to move my country. Um, but it can also be the type of audience that you're reaching to as well. You know, I want to talk to all small business owners. It could, setting a time can be really helpful. It can be as near as like, you know, by the end of, you know, in two months time, it could be like before I'm dead. <laughs> I have a, on my computer, I have a little death date, September the 15th, 2043, which statistically is when I'm going to die. And I use that as a, a by when date for me. And then in terms of volume, it might be the amount of money you spend or the amount of money you, you raise or, um, or just a kind of quantity that you're striving for. You know, I'm coming back to the worthy goal I saw way back when, which is like to affect 150, to, to, to move 150 people out of poverty in this specific part of the world. That's a really nicely drafted worthy goal if it's thrilling and important and daunting for that person because of how specific it is. And you can see how different this might be from those broader goals, which are like, you know, create happiness in the world. So you're doing a third and final draft. If you want, to um, uh, if you want to share that third and final draft in the chat, you're welcome to do that. If you're like, nope, I'm keeping this private for myself, that's cool as well. But that's what I wanted to cover. You know, this is the first step of three from the How to Begin book, um, which is around actually spending the time to actually figure out what what actually might be a worthy goal and how do I interrogate it in such a way to start making it a bit more specific. And you can see that with by adding this one word, having kind of bad mouth smart goals <laughs> a little earlier on, I'm actually suggesting maybe there's something we can take from that to actually give it a little more specificity that might move up the voting test for thrilling and important and daunting out of 21. Um, Kukskal, Kukskal, and I'm probably getting that wrong. Kuxal is asking how long or how detailed might a worthy goal be? Just a sentence, a paragraph, or a page long text. It's whatever serves you. But for me, having it in a sentence or two means that I've got really clear on what it can be and what it can feel like. So um, that crispness of definition is, is helpful for me, just to, to keep reminding me what my goal is. My goal is to have a top 3% podcast. Um, that is what I wanted to take, talk to you about. So before we open it up to questions, and before I hear from Lucy, I am interested to ask you of all the stuff that we've covered, and we've covered a lot in our hour or so together, what's been most useful and what's been most valuable here for you? What's the thing you want to remember from this? So feel free to share that in the chat box. And I'm going to turn it over to Lucy and go, Lucy, what's I mean, let me ask you that question. What's struck a chord for you in all of this? It struck a chord for me. Thank you for asking me. <laughs> I'm happy to share that you reminded me of what I called my mission as a coach mm. and uh, as a worthy goal. Um, so I'm associating it as a worthy goal, which is my lifetime goal. And that is to disrupt workplace complacency and get to the nice. heart of what really matters. So, so I appreciate that. I love that. And you can see how this is a really nice example of disrupting workplace complacency is a mission. There's not, there's not a specific thing you're going to, you're, you're naming in that as to how you do it. But then is that like, you could choose all sorts of worthy goals of how to do that, which is like, go deep and reinvent an entire company, write the book of disrupting workplace complacency you know, parade naked down the streets of Toronto as a way of drawing attention to your particular mission. I mean, I'm not suggesting you do that. I'm suggesting there's all sorts of different worthy goals in terms of how you best come at that mission. And sometimes I think people have the, the mission 
and then they have a lot of little tactics and they don't have they haven't named the worthy goal as the thing that they're going to commit to as the best guess they've got at the moment to serve their bigger picture Mm -hmm. That's really helpful, Michael. I, I have some ideas around that. I'll, I'll spare that for another time. One main, like, question that links back to your three tests. One of the questions that's been asked is, can you name those three tests more, you know, um, one, two, and three? Yeah. Number one, the spouse-ish test. Go ask that person who plays a role of uh, who knows you well and ask for their feedback. That helps you with thrilling. Number two is important. And that's the FOSO test, for the sake of. And number three is the thing that tests on daunting, which is the Goldilocks zone. How do you make sure it's not too big, not too small, but has the right weight and heft for you that it feels like you know how to start it, but not necessarily how to finish it? Thank you, Michael. And you also mentioned the voting test and the add more one more word. Are those tests as well? Well, they're different, they're different parts of the process. So call them a test if you want. I mean, I think this idea of working through three rounds of a draft, and look, we did three, three drafts in an hour. So that's fast. Um, I know there's a bunch of people who are like, too fast, <laughs> way too fast for me. Other people going, you're a bit slow, Michael, quite frankly, if you could have talked a bit less, <laughs> we could have done this in half an hour. Um, and then there's some people who go, you know what, part of, I do think there's some magic in when you go fast, sometimes it stops you getting in your own way and overthinking some of this stuff. So I think there's something powerful about that. Wonderful. Thank you. So ready for the remainder of the Q&A? Sure. All right. I want people so to do that, throw, throw questions into the Q&A or yes. throw, yeah, that's what we want to do. Absolutely. So we have one from Neil more recently. He asks, can MBS go through the three Ps again? I didn't get the way to use them. Sure. So three Ps are project, people, and patterns. And they're different elements of any worthy goal. The project is the doing of it. The people are the relationships of it. And the patterns are you and how you show up and the work that you do. And all three of those are always entwined in any worthy goal because there's always work to be done. There's always relationships to be managed and there's always yourself to be managed, your own messiness and the way that you will get slippery and collude against yourself and find ways of undermining your very own commitment to the worthy goal. And the three Ps just gives you a lens into figuring out which one of these feels most important or should I, should I focus on in this worthy goal? Thank you. Gareth asked earlier, Sounds like you're talking about outer goals. He asks, what about inner goals, such as trust that all will be well? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I think I am talking about outer goals, which is um, because I think trust all that will be well is is a powerful mantra and a self-management piece. But do I think the world is better by you trusting that all will be well? I'm not sure. And part of what I want is a goal, part of what I'm encouraging here is a goal that is important to you, but also makes the world, gives more to the world than it takes. So I think that you're right. I think this is probably a bit separate from those kind of internal self-management pieces. But trusting that all could be well, as an example, could play an extent, a, a really important part in you self-managing your way to achieving a worthy goal. I found that really helpful, actually, Michael, just to remember the tension of self-serving yeah. and world-serving. Thank you. Now, Joanne asked, I have too many goals to choose from. How do I narrow them down? Well... I think one of the ways that we sometimes get in our own way is we we get <laughs> we suffer I, and I speak for myself here um, shiny object syndrome, which is like oh here's the next interesting shiny thing. I'll, let me take that on. And as much as it kills me to say it, I just think that you can really do one, maybe two worthy goals at one stage. You know, 
I, I, I have a habit of perpetually over committing myself. Um, I've tried to do two worthy goals at the same time. And what I find is I'm doing neither of them as well as I would like. So a classic example is um, at the moment, I've got a worthy goal around a podcast. Somebody asked the title of the podcast. It's called Two Pages with MBS. So it's where brilliant people read the best two pages of a favorite book. And then we talk about the two pages that they read. So you can find that wherever you find your podcast. And I'm trying to get this book out into the world. And, um, uh, and honestly, I've just come, come to the <laughs> blindingly obvious conclusion that I already knew, which is I just can't do both of these. So I've actually had to say, I can't think about how to grow my podcast now because I just can't do that and also do true justice, be fully committed to what it takes to get the book ready for launch and the, the, the bits and pieces, the bonuses and all that sort of stuff that we're going to prepare for the, the January launch. So I think you, make, you take your best guess, you commit to it and you work it. I, I do six weeks because six weeks is long enough to make real progress, but short enough that if I made the wrong choice on what to work with, it's not a it's not a huge sunk cost. Um, and then at the end of six weeks, step back and go, am I still happy with this worthy goal? Has it changed? Has it evolved at all? Feels a little bit like that introspection. You know, there's this inner, you know, inner oh, thinking yeah. about what, yeah, yeah. yeah it's very, very I mean, powerful. The, the thing about a worthy goal is once you get clear on it, how to do it isn't that isn't that obvious? It's not like typing into an address into Google Maps and kind of ending up at your destination. It's just not that simple. It's much more like, you know, Indiana Jones, you know, you're in a jungle and there's a mist covered valley and there's a mountain peak over there, which may be your mountain peak, but maybe not, who knows? And you're feeling your way forward around that. Um, and, you know, in, in the book, I definitely the, sec the final section is a little bit about how do you cross the threshold and make progress? Uh, around this um, when you're when you're nervous when it's daunting so it's it's stretching you and provoking you and growing you when it's not immediately obvious all the things you should be doing yeah it's it's a worthy goal it's it's tricky mm. yeah you know uh, the introspection so there's a question from Antonio what motivated you Michael to develop this system of worthy goals uh well, I started to try and write a book and it turned into this book. <laughs> I, you know, often the seed of a book is in, the, in a previous book that you wrote. So I wrote The Coaching Habit and um, I noticed that there were some people who took the seven questions and went, these are amazing. And I started using them and it's changing my coaching and changing my leadership and changing my families. Of course, there were a few people who picked up the book and went, you suck and the book sucks and I hate you. I hate the book. And that's fine. They're, but there were a bunch of people in the middle who were like, I like the ideas here. I'm finding it really hard to act on them. Mm -hmm. So the Advice Trap book, as well as sharing kind of additional coaching tactics, is a deeper dive into behavior change. What does it take to actually shift your behavior when there's resistance around that? And... Um, when I finished writing that, I'm like, I think there's still more to be said around that. So I wanted to write a book about a, trying to make more accessible some of the deeper struggles around behavior change, because that's what we're, we're trying to do as coaches. Mm -hmm. And I thought this new book, How to Begin, would be about that. But it evolved into, there's no point in changing your behavior unless you're changing it for something that matters. Mm -hmm. And... I do believe fundamentally that for you to take on a worthy goal, you know, right at the start, I think the first or the second thing I showed you was we unlock our greatness by working on the hard stuff. So part of what this is about is unlocking your greatness, changing your behavior, changing who you are. And the second, the second of the three sections in the book is that a kind of deeper dive into what does it mean for you to move from you plus to you 2.0 from present you to future you and that's what I thought the book was mostly going to be about but then the worthy goal thing showed up in my head and I'm like I think this is actually the book well you've written several books and you're a thought leader in our in our space 
Lynn is asking that this is pro or uh, commenting first. This has provided a framework for thinking about what it is I want to do, uh, which right. is a worthy goal. I feel as if I've been coached and mentored in one go. The question is, is this the future of coaching? Uh, I don't, I doubt it. <laughs> but here's what I know, or here's what I suspect. Part of the future of coaching is automatic coaching, AI-based coaching. You know, it, we are not very far away from us simply going, hey, Siri, coach me. Hey, Alexa, coach me. And Alexa will go, sure, Michael, what's on your mind? And I'll go, blah, 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 blah. And Alexa will go, huh, you talked about that last week. Michael, what's the real challenge here for you? And I'll go, blah, 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 blah. And Alexa will go, great. What else, Michael? What else is a challenge here for you? And I'll go, oh, blah, 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 blah. And, and Alexa will go, great, what else? I'm like, blah, 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 blah. And then Alexa will go, okay, so Michael, what's the real challenge here for you today? What's the real challenge? And I'm like, oh, Alexa, brilliant question. Blah, 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 blah. And th this is happening with something that doesn't interrupt, doesn't offer me random advice, is private. I'm no chance of losing face. I'm not trying to perform to it because I'm not trying to impress anybody. So there's a way that the coaching you do at its most transactional will become or will become outsourced to a computer. So you have to find a way with your clients of being committed with them to create something extraordinary out of their life. And I think helping people be more ambitious for themselves and the world is one of the things that coaches can do and Alexa is gonna find trickier. So I don't think this is the future of coaching, but I think the future of coaching is knowing what's, what, the, what the truly, I, I guess what truly matters in terms of this coaching relationship and what makes them go, I can only get this from Lucy or whoever you are. <laughs> that really resonates for me as I'm say, as you, as I'm hearing you say it, Michael. You know, just that there's this infinite aspect of the work that we do. It's continuously changing. So there's no one thing that's the future. That's what came up for me. Uh, so this has been an incredibly engaging and provoking, uh, thought-provoking session. Uh, people are saying I'm feeling it too. Thank you so much, Brilliant. Michael Bungay Senior. We will just take, we'll take some more questions in just a second. Uh, as you know, WBEX is coach created and so that we can continue providing you with the services you love, we will be sharing a survey right at the end of the session. So please take a few moments to share your input on this summit session and what you would like to see us build into the future of WBEX. The survey will automatically pop up when you leave the Zoom webinar. And it's also in the chat box. So now, I have an additional question that's sort of like a springboard. Um, and let me find it again here. <laughs> here it is, Angela. A worthy goal feels circular, almost infinite to me, as opposed to linear, i.e. achieve the goal, check the box. So question, how is progress for worthy goals measured or how is it measured different from a smart goal? Yeah, that's, that is an insightful comment, I think. I think smart goals often can just feel, how do, I, how do I check the box? And there's something about a smart goal for me that has never quite worked. I mean, I'm sure I've set them and gone, oh, it's smart, measurable, something relatable, timely or something. I can't quite remember. But um, part of what's built into a worthy goal is a reminder about why it matters. It's thrilling and it's important and it's daunting. So it has a resonance that keeps calling you forward, I hope. I do think, though, that it is measurable and tick offable. Um, that's part of that kind of making it tangible enough that you can see progress. Like, I know 
like I, in the book, I talk about two worthy goals. One is launching this podcast, being a top 3% podcast. To be a top 3% podcast, you need a roughly 8,000 downloads per episode in the first 30 days. I'm well short of that. <laughs> I'm definitely not a top 3% podcast. I have not achieved my goal. It is black and it is white. The, uh, the second worthy goal was me giving up being the CEO of Box of Crayons, the training company that I founded. And um, that evolved from stopping being the CEO to um, a less quantitative, more qualitative measure, which is around a gracious handover of power. And, but, I, but I could measure that. I could definitely say, and I could talk to Shannon, who became the CEO of Box of Crayons, you know, has this been a gracious handover of power or not? So um, I do think worthy goals are measurable and I think goals start and they finish um, because, you know, in three years time, I'd expect you to be working on a different worthy goal. You're like, okay, just like, you know, three years ago or five years ago, I was working on the coaching habit as my worthy goal. I'm like, I want to write the book that is a classic coaching book. And I think I did that with the coaching habit, but that's no longer my worthy goal. I've got a different thing that I'm focused on now. I have to say this comment. Um, it's from Alexa. She says, <laughs> what is the real challenge here? Thank you, Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, too tempting, had to say it. <laughs> Thank you. You mentioned, uh, Melanie asks, uh, you mentioned um, six week sprints. Can mm -hmm. you, so this is a question. Would MBS expand on the concept of the six week sprints as it relates to worthy goals? Yeah. First question, is the intent of the sprint to refine the goals? No. So the second question first, the intent of the sprint is to make progress on the goal. It's to do work, but it's to, so a worthy goal can feel a bit overwhelming. It's like, where do I start? So the way that the six week sprint works for me is I go, okay, what can I achieve in six weeks? And specifically, what can I achieve in this coming six weeks? Because some six weeks I have other things going on and some six weeks are a bit clearer. So I've got a, a certain amount of capacity and resource that I'm available to tap into over those six weeks. And because a worthy goal is complex <laughs> rather than linear and straightforward, um, what I've noticed is if I, I, I set my goal, worthy goal, and then I set what I call a chapter goal. And I'm like, here's my six weeks chapter. <laughs> I'm trying to write um, six of those a year. Um, so yeah. And um, what, what progress can I make for this chapter? And then I go for it. And I'm like, I'm trying to make progress. And I'm really specific about what I'm trying to do in those six weeks. And at the end of the six weeks, Angelie and I stop and we go, let's, let's talk about how we did. Did we hit our goal? Did we not hit our goal? What does that teach us about the goal we set ourselves? What does this teach us about a worthy goal, the bigger picture? And then we take a week or two to reset, figure out what the next sprint is, and also tidy up the miscellaneous other stuff that's happened in the six weeks. And then we set ourselves another sprint. So I got the broad idea from this from um, a company called Basecamp, um, which is a tech uh, company. And um, actually, I can show it to you. And the specific book that, that inspired this is a, by a guy called Ryan Singer, who I'm not even sure is with Basecamp at the moment. But, you know, stop running in circles and ship work that matters. So this draws on things like agile. And um, it just creates a discipline for making progress without getting overwhelmed by the size of your project and also adapting to what your project or your worthy goal needs most in that moment. Mm. Mm. It feels like that strategy of chunking down, you know, like just breaking things down into manageable pieces. Yeah. <laughs> so Michael, thank you. Thank you so My much. Pleasure. Thank you, Michael Bungestanier, MBS, AKA. <laughs> That's right. Um, that brings us to the end of today's session. And it went by like that. <laughs> but before we go, I just want to very quickly run through how we can keep the conversation going. And as many of you know, we have a new 
and exclusive WBEX community, which we launched in the pre-summit. You now have an exclusive full summit er uh, area within that community, and this will be your place to connect with other coaches, to engage with full summit sessions and content, to share knowledge, so many things, learn about what's going on in the world of coaching, see what the future of coaching is, you know, in terms of the community. We have a dedicated post there to discuss Michael Bungay Stainer's session, and we're dropping that link in right now. And I have the good news here, <laughs> and that is that Michael, MBS, will be dropping in the community over the next 24 hours to answer questions that you may not, that we couldn't maybe get into today's session, so that if you have any more questions, that is the place to ask. Jean will drop the link, if she hasn't already, in the chat box on that specific post. So if you're not logged into the community, then you'll need to log into the WBEX members area first, and then you'll be able to access it. And the next thing that we want to, commit, uh, want to mention are our implementation mastery or IM sessions. The IM sessions related to today's presentation will take place 30 minutes after the end of today's session and also next Tuesday. And we offer these sessions in multiple languages and the languages you can enjoy an IM session in today are Arabic, English, Portuguese, and Russian. You can sign up by clicking on the in the chat box. I'd also like you uh, to know that our WBEX roundtables are available throughout the full summit. And he's a taster of these small group discussions around a range of topics, coaching the military, thriving at work, leveraging the connection between well-being and productivity, unpacking bias, focus and decision-making and many more. And to find out more about the WBEX roundtable sessions and the different topics that you can join in the discussion around this, please click in your chat box. But finally, please remember to submit your feedback on this session via the survey that will pop up as soon as the session ends. Your next full summit session is Amanda Blake at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And it's a coaching demo, embodied coaching in action. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, MBS. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me along. I appreciate it. Nice to work with you all. See you next time. Bye-bye.